Hello, my name is Zach Felix. Um, I am an associate professor of biology at Reinhardt University. And this is a part of the UGA Extension Cherokee County Master Gardeners uh, presentation series. So I, um, you know, have always loved biology. Uh, I get asked to speak a lot about snakes. I'm actually more of a salamander, lungless salamander uh, guy, but snakes just have the ability to capture people's imaginations. Right? Rarely do I find somebody that is not, you can't engage about snakes with. Right? Some people love them. Most people are on the other end of the spectrum, right? but it's an opportunity for me as an educator um, to engage with people and hopefully shed some light. Uh, I do a lot of kids presentations, libraries, things like that, and I often tell the parents that there's plenty of things that their kids should be afraid of, but snakes don't need to be one of them. So I've kind of taken it on as a mission to help people to understand a little bit more about snakes and uh, enough to be more comfortable going about their business. I think this is very appropriate for gardeners. Um, you've got to spend a lot of time outdoors. And, um, you know, I think a little bit of knowledge can really increase comfort level. So that's sort of my goal for the day today is to give you a bit of information about snakes to help you to feel more comfortable living alongside of them. So I think obviously the biggest thing about snakes that really captures people's imagination is the idea that they can be venomous. Right? There is a poisonous and venomous snake called the tiger keelback. Poisonous means you have to be, you have to eat the animal or you have to ingest the toxin versus a venomous animal such as a snake or a bee or an ant um, can inject the toxin into your body. So we see in this little graphic here uh, different versions of this venomous. Most of our snakes, particularly here in Cherokee County, and really most of the snakes in Georgia, are uh, what we call agliphous. They do not have any fangs, so all their teeth are about the same. Um, there are some which I'll tell you about that have we're called them rear fangs. So they have this is a cross section of the fang, and it's just a little groove where the venom um, can run through the groove down the back of the fang and can be introduced into the bloodstream of usually their prey items. There are front fanged snakes that have a hypodermic or a hollow fang that is found in the front of the mouth and these are fixed they uh, compared to the selenoglyphic hypodermic needle type fang that is on a swivel right? um, we have all of these species uh, in Georgia which out here again I'll talk about I do not have luckily green mambas this is a uh, cobra relative found in Africa as I understand, uh, my friend John Rocco told me he grew up in South Africa and he said this is the animal he is definitely afraid of. They are incredibly fast, very toxic venom, but you see those fangs in the front of the mouth. We don't have mambas, but we do have coral snakes. This is the eastern coral snake. In Georgia, they're found, but not anywhere close to Cherokee County. This is a coastal plain animal, largely. So us being at the top of the Piedmont, we're not lucky enough to be able to see coral snakes. This is that selenoglyphic. This is the front fang. You can see that hollow hypodermic um, fangs. And this whole, really the whole skull of snakes are amazing. They're called kinetic skulls. Uh, different from our skull, which all of those, we have the same bones, the parietal bone, the palatal, prefrontal, all these bones, but they're all fused into our skull versus a snake has a very flexible, movable skull. The maxillary bone here is on a swivel, and so these fangs can be folded back, they can be folded forward. Right? We even see the dentary bone, the lower jawbone, it's not even really attached except by ligaments, so it allows the snake 
to open their mouth very wide, stretch their mouth over large prey items, and actually the palatal, the palatin bone here can lock the skull up around the prey item. So here's some of the selenoglyphic venomous snakes of Georgia. This is the, probably the snake that I, I would I will say the majority of our apprehension about snakes in Cherokee County should come from this animal right here. And this is the Northern Copperhead, not because it's deadly. I, I don't believe there is ever a single recorded uh, documented case of somebody dying from a copperhead bite. Um, but certainly could ruin your weekend, right? So get to know. I'll, I'll tell you guys this is one lesson. If you can learn to identify the copperhead and know that a snake is not a copperhead, then that's a good start. Okay. We do also have the timber rattlesnake in Cherokee County. I uh, will discuss those guys. And then very, very rarely, I've heard of two records, one from um, ball ground and one out in Salicoa. This is the pygmy rattlesnake, a different group of rattlesnakes. Very small little snake. In fact, I've never seen one in my life. Um, they have tiny little rattles. Sounds more like a insect than a what you'd think of a rattlesnake's sounding like. But then, you know, just to complicate things, when I told you I was going to uh, make you less afraid but here are three common and native snakes found here in uh, Cherokee County this is a ringneck snake uh, this is a eastern hognose snake and this is a garter snake people call them garden snakes grass snakes all three of these snakes are actually venomous right in that they have these rear fangs all right here's that hognose snake you see the upturned snout of the hognose snake and there's those rear fangs in the back. Now, I only say that they are venomous because that's, you know, zoologically accurate. Effectively, they're totally harmless. Um, in order to get envenomated by one of these animals, you'd have to let them bite you and then chew on you until they get those fangs in the back of the mouth uh, worked into your hand. Uh, and then even then, it would be like a bee sting or something. So... This is more of a kind of trivial trivia um, for you than a public service announcement. Okay, so uh, there are a group of rear fang venomous snakes in, in Cherokee County that are, again, totally harmless, really incredible. They think this may have to do with, these rear fangs may have to do with eating American toad with different types of toads, and which tend to blow themselves up like a balloon, and they can use this to pop the that balloon and also um, to uh, help to immobilize their prey. So uh, venomous snakes, right? Obviously, a consideration. Um, this is some statistics. Again, I tend to be kind of hyper rational person um, and look at uh, evidence when it comes to determining risk levels okay so here are five years worth of data here is five years worth of data and uh needs updated this came from the georgia poison center in atlanta and we see these are total snake bites that were reported to the poison center that doesn't mean that it was a venomous snake uh, it just means that somebody called and said a snake has bit me. Okay, so there were over 2,000 total in those five years. It's amazing how really um, consistent these numbers are. Around 400 total bites each year. Most of those bites come from copperheads. Significant number come from rattlesnakes, and that includes the different pig, the pygmy rattlesnake, timber rattlesnake and the eastern diamondback in southern georgia uh, so certainly uh, 80 percent of the confirmed venomous snake bites come from copperheads 
uh, and you know that's uh, significant numbers uh, 130 140 bytes a year uh, of those cases about one in five people have to use antivenom a lot of times people get bit by a venomous snake and the snake doesn't waste its venom by injecting it into the human right? they know that they're not going to eat the human and so they will do what's called a dry bite where they bite and can they can carefully meter how much venom they use and it's been shown actually that that metabolically it's very uh, expensive to produce venom okay so snakes can not going to want to waste its venom on something that it can't even eat so only one in five people that get bit um, actually have to be administered with antivenom okay and then um, of all of those bites we see most people have minor or moderate effects again I'm not trying to minimize this because I'm not trying to get bit by a copperhead today and have moderate effects and because um, this can be very expensive it can be very painful right um, but again it's a matter my goal today is not to say poo poo people who are afraid of snakes but to try to give a little perspective okay um, and then one person in the state of Georgia has died in the last in during those five years from a snake bite right and I think that's pretty typical about on average in the United States about 12 people die from um, venomous snake bites okay now during the course of this presentation unfortunately 12 people have probably died from car accidents or household accidents or poisonings around the house um, so there's a lot of things that are much pose a much higher risk for our health and safety than snakes and so um, you know for the those certain people who will hear this will say okay well that that, that makes me feel a little better All right, my brother a full-grown adult he but actually his fear is, is even more rational than that as of frogs and he won't even go out at night to bring his garbage out because he's afraid there may be a frog out there you know to me the the point is you know let's try to be fearful of things in proportion to their actual risk okay so and that this is another part of the story is that the venom produced by the snake right it's a very in incredible cocktail of these what I call biomolecules okay so biomolecules are things to me um, that only can be produced by living organisms we can't go into the lab and produce these um, they're big they're complex molecules and they are very useful for medicine normally so in the middle we see this biomolecule here is human insulin and obviously everybody understands the uh, significance of, of uh, insulin um, and its importance for health um, but something to consider is that there isn't a machine that is producing insulin someplace it used to be horses were used to make insulin because inside of a horse's cell inside of a you know most of us have cells that um, are produced capable they have a the little machinery capable of producing this complex molecule now we largely use large vats of bacteria living bacteria that read the DNA of a human insulin molecule and produce this molecule for us so these molecules are one reason we need to keep biodiversity around is because we don't have a chemist or machine to produce these biomolecules right we have to have living things to do so for us so here's another important biomolecule it's called contorturstatin it's a protein molecule most of these molecules that are really um, important are proteins uh, it's produced in southern copperhead venom so copperheads have the DNA 
code for this molecule. It is a what's called a disintegrin. And what it does is breaks down tissue. Uh, that's largely why a vet of Copperhead would have venom as it injects this cocktail of venom uh, of these different proteins, which will help to basically digest the prey from the inside so that when the snake swallows the prey without chewing it, it can um, it can recover the the energy from those from the tissue of the the mouse or whatever. So this what the disintegrin is made for is digesting things like mice. What it has proven to be useful for is to prevent tumor cells from attaching to other tissue. So imagine a tumor um, that develops in the breast tissue and then becomes metastatic and some of these errant cells get into the blood stream, they get into your lymphatic system, they travel through the circulatory system and maybe attach into your lungs. The ability to spread and attach is what makes cancer so dangerous, but these disintegrin proteins can help to prevent that um, metastatic cancer cell from attaching to uh, another tissue type. So this this is something that is um, you know, and this this was published in 2018, so that's three years ago already. A novel venom-derived peptide for brachytherapy of glioblastoma. Glioblastoma, very terrible um, brain cancer. So, very cool. Um, breast cancer, brain cancer, right? All from these biomolecules produced by the eastern copperhead, right? So, I just think this is a cool part of the story. Right, um, we we need to have these animals around uh, because we don't. I mean, that's just one protein that we know about um, that is useful. So the takeaway here is, snakes contain the DNA code to make very valuable molecules. So that is a reason to love snakes. So here's a check out this snake. This is a very large northern pine snake. Um, it is being operated on. Some of you may recognize Greg Nutt. Uh, Greg and his wife Simone own Riverstone Animal Hospital, wonderful uh, vet hospital. And um, I'm helping to, to show Greg how to implant. And we'll see this middle of the table here. This red object is a radio transmitter. We implant into this big six foot long yellow pine snake. And that allows us to find her anytime that um, I want to. I can use a little receiver and track her down called radio telemetry. Okay, and here are points. <clears throat> this is in Waleska, Georgia. The road from the upper left of the screen headed, this is headed southeast, is Route 140. Here's the Fellaini Performing Arts Center. And then the other road here coming down from upper right going would be southwest is route, State Route 108. Okay, in, from left to right, it's about two miles. Up to down is about one and a half, 1.3 miles. So we see these snakes. This is four different snakes over the course of a couple of years. There's one snake that moved from the Funk Heritage Center to way up here near Pleasant Arbor Road um, to, uh, you know, miles worth of, of movement here that this, these animals are moving. All right. So one takeaway here is that these snakes are moving a lot. I think there's a tendency if you see a snake out back of your house to think, that that's you've just drawn an unlucky card and that snake has chosen you and it's going to be under your porch forever and ever but chances are if you see a snake there under your porch today tomorrow it's it's gone right um and the other takeaway here is we can see 
If we zoom in, this is a part of the world I'm very familiar with. This is our wonderful campus up here at Reinhardt University. Um, wonderful music and entertainment here at the Fellaini Performing Arts Center. Here's the um, Georgia's Frontier and uh, Native American Museum, the Funk. Um, these animals are right in the middle of our campus, right? This is, many of these points come from that big female, yellow, uh, six foot long snake. And they actually, pine snakes make a large, really loud blowing noise if uh, they are spotted. So this is not an inconspicuous animal. And they were found in the president's yard over here by the church where my child went to preschool all around my building here. Here's the Fincher art building, right? So, and but yet never once did anybody call me to say, hey, Zach, your snake is over here, right? So the takeaway here is that if a snake is in your yard, you're probably not going to know about it, right? And I, to me, that's that's the good news because Again, being rational, if we know that we've been surrounded by snakes up to this point and we never knew it and there was never an issue and nobody got harmed, then that may help you to feel a little bit more comfortable to know that there are snakes around. Okay. Other lesson learned from our telemetry is that as these snakes are moving about, we we'll see it's not random the type of places that they uh, tend to stop and and rest. See the forested areas are not well used, right? The ten places they tend to use. Here's the here's the F pack roof, open, uh, very grassy areas, lots of uh, native wildflowers, um, lots of structure, um, shrubs, concrete, stone. These animals love to get up inside of any kind of junk piles. Um, this is a big, you know, I think this was used to go over Shoal Creek as a bridge and busted it up and set it here. These snakes love, here's actually my radio telemetry equipment. And one of our snakes was down in this pile of concrete. So what does this tell us? Is that if a snake is in your yard, it's either moving through and you just happen to catch it when it's moving from point A to point B, or probably more likely, whatever you've created there in your uh, landscaping and in your gardening, the snake really likes the habitat that you've made. So that that we can work with in terms of, um, and I'll we'll bring this back home later uh, when I talk about um, you know the big conclusions, but something to think about. So. If you want to be comfortable with snakes, I'd say the first rule is to know which species you're dealing with. That is to be able to have some basic uh, identification skills for snakes here in Cherokee County. Now, and this is uh, something I do in my classes, right, is learn, learning to identify animals. And I'm going to tell you again, this is not an easy task. There are 42 snakes in Georgia. There are 23 that I can think of as being found here in Cherokee County. That's kind of overwhelming. Even if you just get a book on the snakes of Georgia, right? You, you can open up the book and just search through those 42 species account and hope for the best. Um, and then I'll address these two uh, bullet points here that basically make this very difficult, right, is to uh, learn to identify things. So what we're going to do today, and this um, I was approach I've kind of developed over the last years, is we don't need to in consider all 42, and really we don't need to consider all 23 snakes uh, that are found in Cherokee County. We're going to look at the ones that are the most important, um, and I'll define what that means. And then we're also going to talk about the sp really specific characters that you can memorize that will help you to identify those species. Okay, so why is identification of snakes so important? Let's look at a little scenario. This is not an untypical scenario. Say you find this little snake over here, right? And then you go to 
uh, your your book. This is sort of like the the Bible for um, reptiles and amphibians of Georgia. And you open up to the snake section, all right, and you find this is the account for the red-bellied snake. It's the closest thing that you've found, right? You could read about the description, right? But when you look at this snake, it's different color, right? Um, so I don't know. Is that a red-bellied snake? Turns out it is a red-bellied snake. What about this animal? Right? Has the red belly. That seems to point to a red-bellied snake. But it has these really obvious stripes down its back. And it, again, it's a, it is a slightly different color. The head's a little brownish. This one's more of gray. I don't know. Is it a red-bellied snake? It is. Brown with a red belly. Stripes. See the variability among red-bellied snakes. It's not going to match up. Normally you get one picture from your field guide. This field guide, which I'll recommend later, does have a couple of pictures, but you can't possibly encompass all of the variability found in each species in a book, right? So what I recommend that we do here, I'm going to cover that up because that's not even a red-bellied snake, um, is to memorize a few characteristics of each species. We're going to look for characteristics that are consistent among even considering all this variability, right? One is that they're a pretty small snake. Let see, here's one I found in ball ground uh, in my hand. So they're small. They never get if you get a big snake that's over really over a foot long, it's not a red bellied snake. Uh, they always have a red belly, red ish belly. So that is consistent whether you're brown back, gray back, or tan back, the belly is always red. They tend to have stripes, right? Tend is an important word here, meaning it's not a hold fast rule, but they tend to have some kind of striping. But to me, the red belly, and then we're looking for this light colored spots of ring on the back of the head. So whether you are red, reddish brown background, gray, or tan, each of them has this little light colored spot behind the head. And this one here too also had that. Okay, so that, that's consistent. You memorize these things, you know, it's a small one, you know the red belly, Right, looking for those light stripes, that's a red bellied snake every single time. Okay, every time. So, the takeaway look at many pictures of each species. Okay, that's an approach I'll demonstrate in a bit. You can't just look at one picture and know what that whole animal looked like. Imagine an alien comes from outer space and wants to learn to identify humans. Right? What do humans look like? Right? Colors, uh, hair configuration, type of hair, height, all these things are variable among the human species. Right? So, wh who do you put in the alien space uh, field guide to, hu to humans? What kind of picture? Do you put a picture of me? Well, then, right? They're going to. So, the point is, You've got to look at pictures that encompass the variability and then know characters that are less likely to vary among individuals. Okay. Uh, another thing that makes this confusing is that even within a species, there's change that happens as a baby rat snake grows into an adult rat snake, as a baby black racer grows into an adult black racer. Right, so this and this are the same species, right? And vice versa, or likewise over here, this and this are the same species. So you have to know which snakes display changes as they grow. We call these ontogenetic changes. You have to know, does a baby garter snake look like an adult garter snake, right? 
or do they change as they grow? Little snakes are not always baby snakes. I think uh, one of the top of my list of, um, you know, I, I will encourage you later to keep in touch with me and to, um, you know, send me pictures of snakes. I uh, get a lot of requests from people. Um, Jay Baker with the Cherokee County Sheriff's, many of you know Jay, uh, he gets tons and tons of uh, requests from people. People are concerned, again, about snakes. They find a little snake in their at their daycare or um, in their home, and they want to know, is it a snake? Is, is it something they should be worried about? One on high on that list is the baby copperhead, right? People find snakes, and they, everything that they find is a baby copperhead. But little snakes are not always baby snakes. That is to say, this snake right here, this snake right here, these are both full-grown adult snakes. This actually is a little brown snake, ringneck snake. This is a worm snake. This is an earth snake. These None of these snakes, and these are common and abundant here in Cherokee County. And these are ones that you're likely to find in your garden because they live down in the leaf litter. They live down in pine straw. But it's not a little version of a big snake. It is a big version of a little snake. Okay? So, you, again, you've, the, the takeaway, which I don't think I put that on the side, is to know approximate size of snakes. Right? Um, so that you can determine whether you're dealing with a baby snake or an adult snake. Check this beast out. This snake right here in my hand is much larger than any of these snakes. Right? This snake just hatched out of an egg. This is a baby northern pine snake. Actually hatched out of this is the female. Right? Big, huge, beautiful snake we caught up in Waleska. That's Kendall Bird, one of our uh, alumni. Um, and she was full of eggs. We took the eggs out. Well, she laid them, and we grew them up and hatched them. And this is what a baby pine snake looks like, right? So <clears throat> here are the six species that we're going to now focus on learning to identify you, using the same approach, these same roles that I talked about. Now, where did this list of six species come from? This just is from my experience. Of, of trapping road cruising snakes. This is from my experience of re receiving hundreds of emails and text messages from people, pictures of snakes. This is comes from my experience of looking through Facebook um, identification uh, posts. I would guess at least half of the snakes that you'll encounter in Cherokee County will be on this list, right? Um, and then the really the dangerous, quote unquote dangerous snakes in Cherokee County will are found on this list. So if you can learn these six snakes, I will feel confident that you can really make a dent in um, living alongside of, of snakes in Cherokee County. So let's start with um, our friend, the Northern Copperhead, okay? The, this is, they're not a large, but they're not small. I call them medium snake, um, you know, upwards of two, two to three feet. They do not get six feet long. I promise you there is no such thing as a six foot long copperhead. They're pretty stout, meaning they're not a skinny, thin snake. They are fairly wide. Uh, they have keeled scales. I'll show you what that means in a bit. And good news here is that their color pattern um, in terms of variability, the thing that makes identification of snakes really confusing, we see consistency across adults. We see consistency as the snake grows. So that is to say a little copperhead looks just like a big copperhead, except it has a little yellow tail on it. So let's look at some pictures. Oh, actually, before I do that, this is a map of Cherokee showing location where people have reported copperheads uh, and i'll show this for each species 
um, and some pull out some lessons from each. Uh, one lesson is they're found all through Cherokee. Uh, another lesson is they're found in the populated parts of Cherokee. Woodstock, Holly Springs, Canton, right? This is an animal. You can find them in the suburbs. Um, it is not a rare animal. Uh, Virginia Herpetological Society is a great website with lots of ID um, materials. And this is what I'll ask you to focus on by the copperhead. Is look for this hourglass pattern <clears throat> on the back. We see wide starting at the bottom of the snake thin at the top and then back to wide going all the way to the bottom of the snake see these keels um, see individual little lines in each it's like a raised ridge that goes along the length of each scale that gives them this kind of rough appearance all right and then the color scheme right definitely a copper ish colored head and then these pretty browns and um, tan colors. Right. So this is a Waleska animal. Um, flipped under a piece of tin. We see those hourglass shaped markings down the head. I tend to see two dots on the back of the head. There's no markings on the head. There's no marking uh, around the lip, right? We see those hourglass shape markings going down to the bottom up against the belly scales. They do have elliptical pupils, vertical pupils like a cat, and they do have a pit. I don't recommend if you don't know if a snake is a copperhead. And if you don't have if you have vision like mine and you're close enough to see that the pupils are vertical, you're too close to the animal, right? So we have very consistent pattern. Here's a baby copperhead, okay? See the yellow tail? They actually use that little yellow tail. Twitch it, and it will, it's called caudal or tail luring, and they'll lure in little frogs or insects, and then will zap them. See those two dots back in the head? No pattern. No pattern around the mouth. Hourglass-shaped pattern on the back. All right. <clears throat> baby copperhead. Okay, so let me show you this. I, I really like this as a um, as an approach. Go to Google. Get these species that you're interested in. And then hit images. And then here's your way to quickly see a bunch of pictures showing the variability uh, of copperheads. Th so we see some really consistent colors really consistent pattern All right this is this is not your typical i'll bet you that's from texas that's not what you'd expect to see here in in georgia the rest of these things yeah All right but look at the consistency this one this is a pattern that you really rarely expect to see um and then you see some that is not a copperhead that's the other thing you'll start to pick out that's not a copperhead either right this all, again pattern recognition it's important okay so copperhead get to know them timber rattlesnake big snake upwards of five foot very stout heavy keeled scales thick large head but i'll we will urge caution when it comes to identifying venomous snakes based on the shape of their head. I'll talk more about that. Have a black tail, um, but the body can either be yellowish or really dark colored. Okay, Cherokee County, the good news and the bad news is that timber rattlesnakes have been killed out of most of the uh, county. Um, I've talked to old timers in ball ground that say they used to drive up East Cherokee, and they would see rattlesnakes very, very regularly. I'm sure that they used to occur throughout the whole county. Now, <clears throat> the only records that I know about, um, besides maybe down uh, along Alatoona, are up here around Lake Arrowhead, 
um, in Waleska, this large block of land without a lot of, uh, of roads. So if you live in the southern part of the county, you probably do not have to worry about, or even ball ground. You don't need to worry about timber rattlesnakes. This is from iNaturalist. This is an app which I'll speak of later. This is a Cherokee County animal. Um, this is another typical dark phase of the timber rattlesnake. Obviously, you see the rattles and you see these bars across their back. All right, pretty easy to identify. So I think just being aware that they're here and um, looking for a rattle is probably sufficient. All right. Third species, probably the most commonly misidentified, the most commonly encountered big snake in Cherokee County is a, is a rat snake. They used to be called black rat snakes. Now they're called eastern rat snakes. Um, there's a lot of confusion right now in terms of which species is which, so we'll just lump them all. In. The gray rat, the eastern rat, black rat snake into this complex. Big snakes, five, six foot long snakes, not uncommon, uh, that, that size. Uh, there, you can find them in, in your basement, up in your rafters. You find them, if you have chickens, I pro you know about rat snakes. Um, they are one of those animals that the pattern changes with time. In the pattern doesn't change, it just how clearly you can see the pattern changes over time. I'll show you some pictures. Um, it is a light pattern on a dark background. There are some species that have a black background or light background with the dark pattern on it, um, but rat snakes have a light on dark. Scales are weakly keeled, and this um, last bullet point here. To me, you, it comes again with, with having seen probably thousands of rat snakes. There are certain characters that are not in the books usually, but to me, I just see this as being very consistent as the, the, the shape of their eyes and the posture that they take on, to me, really will scream a rat snake. All right. So look at some pictures all over Cherokee. You know, populated, unpopulated. These are very common animals. Okay, here is uh, several different individuals of the rat snake complex. Here's a, a rat snake eating uh, one of our chicken eggs. You see that pattern in the background. It's indistinct. Um, we have the light pattern here. Uh, largely. When the snake is moving and bending, you can see that pattern between its scales. All right. So here are a couple of pretty good sized rat snakes. There's our dog Skippy, very curious. I pulled these out of a trap. Um, you can see some pattern on their belly, pattern on their back. See these here's the keels on the upper right corner. See these keels in each of the scales. Some species like a king snake or racer have no keel at all. Uh, milk snakes will be in that category. Uh, rat snakes have a weak keel. Um, look at those big eyes. Very big eyes. That's just something that I pick up on. Right, compared to other species of snakes. Just look at the size of this animal. This is our daughter, Azalee. Uh, big snakes. Mm -hmm pattern is sort of subtle and not easy to see um, and here is this to me quintessential black rat snake see this kink they're actually kinking their whole ver vertebral column here right this is when you find them in the road and they get really uh, anxious about being stuck out in the open they're very likely to take on this kinky posture and, and to a lesser degree here in this animal. If you see that, it's black, it's a rat snake. All right. Common animal. Brown snakes, <coughs> another one of our little litter snakes. Um, small, slender. They seem to really like to be around people and around human um, 
uh, homes and buildings and things. So that's why I put it on the list here. They have a checkered pattern um, consistently, but the color is quite variable. But they almost always have, similar to the red-bellied snake, because they're in the same genus, they have this marking behind their head. Right? Again, where in Cherokee, yes. You all can stand to see a brown snake. Here's a couple of examples here. This one was in my wife's ceramic studio. You see that checkerboard pattern. There's another different individual with a checkerboard pattern. See the small size. See the checkerboard pattern and see these dark markings behind the head here. Brown snake. They don't, if you flip them over and you can kind of see it on this left picture, the belly is not red colored. That can separate them from the red bellied snake. Okay, here's a brown snake. See the little marking behind the ear. Well, they don't have ears, but behind the head. See the ch checkerboard pattern here. That's a brown snake. Here's a checkerboard pattern and even a marking behind the ear. But the garter snake has a stripe down the back. That's how you can separate those two species. So that's when you really start getting into this, then you'll know approximate size, you'll know pattern, you'll know the lookalikes, the things that you might confuse the animal with. Right? But we're just starting small-ish today. Small-ish. Okay, water snake. Very commonly encountered, very commonly uh, misidentified. Um, and I think part of it is, again, we go to the variability issue here. Medium size, about the same size as a copperhead, very stout snake, heavily keeled scales. Sounds like a copperhead, right? The pattern is different, quite different from a copperhead. So I would focus on this pattern, which I'll show you some pictures of. Colors to me are different than a copperhead too. I just think water snakes are just kind of like a dirty, they, they musk on you, they they bite. It's just kind of a dirty, yucky snake. I mean, I love them and all, but... Um, and then normally in italics, found around water, just because it's not in the water doesn't mean it's not a water snake. Though. All over Cherokee, but very common. Um, along the lake and along the rivers, creeks, anything where there's water. We do not have water moccasins or eastern cottonmouths here. People tend to colloquially call northern water snakes moccasins. There are no venomous copperhead or cottonmouths in Cherokee County. So here's some typical, what I would consider typical water snakes. See again the keels. See these lines here it gives a rough appearance. See the colors, browns, um, you know, kind of like Georgia clay, red, yellowish, just not to me beautiful colors. Um, we see the stout, thick body. Uh, the other thing that I cue in on again, um, this is just for you, our listeners here today, that they may not discuss this in a book, but I cue in on these stripes on the lip, the labial scales. Very consistent to me. Right? Copperheads don't ever have that. They never have stripes on the mouth. See those stripes on the labial scales. Thick keels, heavy bodied, same kind of browns and uh and just brown, so just a muddy looking snake. Finally, the corn snake. Okay, I put this guy in there um, partly just it's a really pretty snake, um, and partly is it, it is commonly it is a commonly misidentified as a copperhead. And so, again, the, the theme here is let's know enough to not be afraid. If you can see the snake, I pulled into the Dollar General at Waleska one time. I was going home, and I saw this mother get out of her. She was driving on like a uh, extended cab Ford Ranger or something, and I saw her <laughs> grabbing her children, pulling them out of the car, and looking in the back, pulling some stuff out of there. And I, I, just something told me 
it, it was a snake in the car. And so I went over and I asked the lady, <clears throat> I said, um, can I help you, ma'am? Not that I thought the, a, a mother needs help because she's more uh, tough than I am, I'm sure. But she said, yeah, there's, I'm, there's a copperhead in my car. And I knew that it was a snake and I thought it's very, very likely going to be a corn snake. And after looking underneath some stuff, it indeed turned out to be a corn snake. And I see this a lot with people um, because the colors of a corn snake tend to be the closest to the colors of a copperhead. Um, Size-wise, they're about the same size. They tend to be a lot thinner. Um, they have the weak keeled scales, similar to a rat snake. Uh, the pattern is definitely very different from a copperhead. Right? We're going to look at these reddish blotches that don't take on the shape of an hourglass. They don't reach the bottom of the the, the snake, and they have a black edge. And I, I should have, and I'll, I'll pull one of these up on Google, but the belly is totally different too than a copperhead. So here's some uh, corn snakes are found. I think they're a lot more common um, than is indicated on this, this map. Um, but here's a couple of what I consider to be pretty typical. This one is uh, from ball ground. Uh, and we see see the pattern. It's not an hourglass shape, and it doesn't reach to the bottom of the animal. The blotches here have a black background or a black edge, and they are not hourglass shaped, and they're just basically on the middle part of the animal. Really pretty snake. Again, look at those stripes on the mouth, similar to a water snake. These are corn snakes. Let me show you the belly of a corn snake only because corn snake belly. Yeah, look at the belly of this guy. See this really distinctive uh, black and white checker. Yeah, here's another one. Okay, so that is very typical of corn snakes. Okay. Here is again from Virginia Herpetological Society comparison of the copperhead on the bottom and the corn snake on the top. Look at the pattern, it goes to the bottom of the snake. Look at the stripes on the lips, no stripes here. Really, there's no pattern on the head of a copperhead versus on the corn snake. But at first glance, sure, I get it. I can see where somebody could see this and think copperhead. Right. Okay. So, six species, and each one getting a couple of minutes of, of treatment. You guys are definitely not going to leave this being a snake expert any more than if I give you an hour of my time, you could make me a master gardener, right? You know? These things take a lot of time to uh, really master. Um, I just want to get people started. I want to give you guys a couple of resources that I think are very valuable. Uh, one uh, is the same book that I showed you here. This is uh, Amphibians and Reptiles of Georgia. It's written by um, some colleagues and friends of mine uh, from the Georgia DNR. Piedmont College, UGA, um, and it's just a really good book. It's You can get a copy for, I think, like $30. It has range maps for each species. So, you know, that's another useful thing. I don't really talk about is, you know, whether the animal is even in our area or not, right? Um, you know, so we look at this species, and um, it's just in the coastal plain, right? I don't even know where I'm pointing. So that, that you can rule that one out by looking at the map really quickly. Um, so get the copy of that book. This is a wonderful website um, put together by folks at the Savannah River Ecology Lab, and uh, they have identification pointers for all the reptiles and amphibians of Georgia and South Carolina, actually. 
Uh, and then finally, and I am a huge proponent of this application. Um, it is free, doesn't take up a lot of space on your phone. Uh, and it, what it is, you think of it as like an online community of nerds like myself. Right? You can find me on there. I think I'm Z Felix. We can hang out on iNaturalist. Um, and it's amazing from a lot of standpoints, but relevant to what we've been talking about here today in terms of um, knowing what's around us. You can do what's called explore and you can look at Cherokee County and see what other species of snakes have been found. And for identification purposes, th this is remarkable. You can take a picture of a snake. You can upload it to iNaturalist. There's a little place to say, what did you see when you click on it? It will use this artificial intelligence algorithm to comb through millions of pictures of, of animals and look for the shapes and colors, and it will give you an estimate of what an identification is. And it is amazing how accurate this thing is um, in terms of getting the identification correctly. And then once you post, say you say, well, I think, okay, maybe it's a southeastern crown snake you upload it then other folks can come in behind you and confirm your identification so there's a crowdsourcing um, and social networking side of iNaturalist I love this app and it's not just snakes you can um, Mike Lloyd and I were talking about how you can use it to identify plants or insects that are in your garden check it out it's very very cool so some parting words. Um, one, I, I would say that, uh, you know, to keep the danger posed by snakes in perspective, right? If we were afraid of things um, proportional to how much they harmed us, we'd probably be terrified of this damn thing. We'd be terrified of our car. You would never go near a car, right? Snakes can be posed some threats to humans. Um, but if you're, you know, you learn what you can, use your resources, I think you can minimize that fear. Uh, this, you guys probably of anybody will understand this is about creating poor habitat for snakes. Snakes like places to hide, so reduce things like tin piles, wood piles. They, um, they like cool and damp, right? We tend to think of, you know, oh, it's, I'm not going out in the woods today, it's 90 five degrees and snakes are going to be active. Snakes do not like the dog days any more than we do. Snakes are much more active in May and June and then again September and October than they are in July and August. So they like cool and damp actually. Right? Um, try to learn to coexist. Uh, some things to me, you know, if I I'm, have children, I'm a homeowner, if I find a copperhead in my yard, I'm not happy about it. If I'm driving around and I see a snake away from my home, away from anyone else's home, I, I feel no desire to kill, run over that snake. Snakes, the biggest hazard for them these days is roads. So, you know, just try to carefully navigate around snakes. Um, give them a chance to cross the road. Um, Things like netting, these erosion control netting, snakes get caught up in those things. Really terrible deaths that these things meet. Sticky traps, oof, don't get me started. That's a very inhumane thing, um, to, way to kill, to kill snakes. Um, you know, keep in touch. Here's my email. You can find me at, uh, just do Zach Felix Reinhardt. It'll pull up, send me an email. Um, I, I can, you know, identify pictures if you email them to me um, if you have questions you want to get out in the field sometime be in touch uh, and then a plug for Reinhardt biology right we have a I, I consider it to be a really good program uh, four-year degree Bachelor of Science uh, in biology it's a kind of a general degree uh, students are required to take classes in plant animal genetic ecology sciences microbiology and then you can um, take the upper level classes that will help you uh, to get into uh, med school, dental school, PT. Um, we've had a couple of students going on to Clemson. Um, 
you know, Auburn Graduate School, Ohio State this year, Kennesaw. So we have a great program. We just need more young, bright people. So kids, grandkids, come back to school yourself. Come and see us, right? We're, we're right here in Waleska. Don't forget about us. And then finally, thanks. I really appreciate you guys tuning in. It makes me happy that people uh, are here, not because they need a grade, but they just want to learn. Um, put some feedback down in the comment section. And then I also want to um, thank these different agencies for funding our research uh, with the Northern Pine Snakes. Right? You go to zoos, a lot of your money um, for ticket sales go to conservation. Um, so that's good news. So thanks, guys, and um, we will hope to hear from you soon. All right.